I'm Aaron Seibert. I work for JP Morgan Chase. I am an originator in the New Market Sex Credit Group, which means I find, structure, and close transactions. I cover the entire Midwest uh, and some of the central plain states except for the great state of Ohio, which I lease my colleagues out of the East Coast. We've got folks out of New York. I'm in Michigan, folks in Chicago, uh, California, Texas. We cover the entire state. We do nothing but New Markets. This is our bread and butter. This is our business. This is our chosen um, flogging of a, of a way to make a living. So, <laughs> but we do it happily. Um, so, you know, we're obviously a big player in the marketplace, uh, have been for really since nearly the beginning. I, I laid out my footprint. I, I, my boss is in the audience, so my, my opinions reflect my own and not those at J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. <laughs> it's a you know. So let's start with the uh, introduction. Jim, did you abscond? Oh, you got it, Jim. So the new market tax credit. Oh, those are the parties we're here. Um, New Market Tax Credit Program, the point. The point is to drive investment into low-income communities. I think a lot of the folks in this room are developers or affiliated with developers and are probably familiar with sister credits like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit or the Federal Historic Tax Credit, which are what we call sister credits to this, um, this program. And we're really the genesis of this uh, program. It came out of a project finance background, the lobby for it was largely folks in the low income housing tax credit and historic preservation space, the point to drive investment into low income areas. Um, it's an alternate to conventional capital and the idea was that, that low income communities have a hard time attracting the sorts of, of capital, intensive, capital intensive projects that are needed to get sort of community revitalization off the ground. A lot of folks saw that in distressed communities that were doing housing. Uh, but couldn't get the amenities around housing, retail, grocery, um, human service, uh, you know, these sorts of projects that are needed to complement uh, holistic community revitalization efforts. So the credit was thought up to drive that initiative. Um, project sizing, so for the developer folks in the room, it's a pretty wide range and it tends to fluctuate with how much credit is available in the marketplace at any given time. I think I always say on the very low end is probably we've got five million in here. For a nonprofit, you could probably squeak a five million dollar deal out. For for profits, I tend to skew more towards the seven million dollar in total project cost size as a minimum. You know, something lower than that, it, it's probably not worth the brain damage. Uh, scaling up from there is is big. I mean, we've done. I think the biggest deal I was ever a part of was seventy nine million or eighty million something like that. Uh, the average size this year, my guess, and I'd be interested to hear what you guys say, I think the average this year was somewhere like 15 to 25, something in that realm. And again, that's going to fluctuate with how much credit's out there. But they're, they're, you know, the standard deviations are pretty big. You know, they're, the biggest deal I closed this year, I think it was 35, maybe, something like that. Is that on the project cost or the allocation? Project costs. Yeah. Right, I'm sorry, allocation size, yeah. Allocation size being 35. Yeah, because th that, that, that's an interesting kind of point to distinguish between uh, you have the project cost, which can be of the, you know, as Aaron mentioned, up to the $80 million, where, you know, an $80 million, you know, total project cost financing will not receive, most likely, $80 million worth of allocation. Um, so it's possible to have an $80 million transaction, yet, you may only use 20, 25 million dollars of allocation. So right. it's just kind of trying to distinguish between the two. Um, your your allocation amount that you can receive is, is pretty much capped at your project cost. So if you have a 12 million dollar you know project, you can only receive 12 million dollars of allocation. Right. So what does this mean for your project? The the, the subsidy is a gap filler, right? The, the, the subsidy will fill a gap in your project. What I tell folks is that generally to be conservative nets you 15% of the allocation amount that you bring into a transaction. So if you have a $20 million deal and you can find $20 million in allocation, you're likely to net 15% of 20 million. That's gonna likely come into your transaction in the form of very low interest rate, potentially subordinate debt, that debt's forgiven at the end, or it's ostensibly conceived to be forgiven at the end of a seven year period. So it's money available up front. It's gonna look a lot like a construction to perm loan for you for a seven year term. At the end of seven years, the investor has collected its tax credits. It does not need its money back. So you keep the money, I keep the credits, and we all go away happy. That's the idea. 
you know, that number, that 15% number can get better or worse depending on a lot of different things, fees that are charged, transaction costs, uh, the way that you calculate your exit. There's things that John and, and his partner can explain, but that's sort of the rule of thumb. As I said, it's a gap filler, and I think one important distinction that I'm going to draw here because I didn't see it in the rest of the deck is, is how it contrasts with other credits that you may be familiar with, right? So, so the local housing tax credit and the historic tax credit are, are the two credits that are most related to this credit, but I caution all of you to, if you're in that business, to not try to fit this into that box. There are fundamental differences between how those credits work and how this credit works. Those credits are developer driven, they're project specific, they are allocated to projects, and they run on a sort of a taxable basis concept. A percentage of the dollars you spend generate credits that are then monetized. This program does not work that way. It is not project specific, it is not allocated to developers. The credits are controlled by third party applicants that you have to woo to come into your project. And taxable basis is not really a concept that has a direct correlation to the amount of credit that's generated. Credit's generated by the allocation that's provided. We'll get into that in the structuring, but I, I always start off these conversations because a lot of folks out of the development world know other project-based incentives, and this one works fundamentally different. Okay, so a little history on it. I mean, this is like many tax credits that are involved in community development has had a really broad base of support and has gone through um, different iterations over the year. You can see, um, starting in the Clinton administration and, and currently through the Obama administration, um, rounds and awards, you'll see renewals. Those are all congressional actions and executive approvals for renewals of this program. Currently we're on like a biannual renewal. This is not a permanent program, you know, quote unquote permanent program, like the historic credit of the LIHTC where it would take an act of Congress to eliminate those programs. This program, unfortunately, we're a little shakier. We need Congress to renew this. Now, we've been riding the coattails of AMT fixes and other tax extenders and have gotten all of these successful renewals year after year after year at varying amounts. And we've swan from, what was the GoZone round? Was that $8 billion? What was, the, what was the biggest award? $8 billion with GoZone included? Yeah, with ERA? Eight and a half? Yeah. yeah, so eight and a half when we had GoZone and ERA funding included it, and then sort of five million was a nice place to be for a while, five billion, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And now we're in the three and a half billion dollars in allocation per year, every two years is what the renewals look like. We're hoping that that becomes permanent, we're hoping that gets to the five billion dollar mark, but the world we live in right now is three and a half billion annually. Well, this could be just uh, one great uh, kind of job interview that we're on right now. Yeah, <laughs> so our, yeah, our job right. picture is not very permanent. So, <laughs> highly talented people on this panel. Um, so, as I already touched with the program objective was, it's administered by the Department of Treasury. Right? So, this falls under Treasury in a small subdivision of Treasury called the CDFI Fund, Community Development Financial Institution Fund. Uh, they administer a few programs, but the new markets, I think, being probably their most known and probably sexiest program that they administer. The other funding they do is for community development financial institutions. They do some tribal funding and some other bank enterprise awards. But new markets seems to be the headline grabber for them, and they spend a lot of time with it now. They've got a bond program now, too, though. So uh, that's the lay of the land from the politics. How are credits awarded? How does this industry work? So I told you it's very different from a low-income housing tax credit or historic tax credit. There's no state-based entity. There's no housing finance authority. There's no, nothing like that. It's administered at the federal level. CDEs, submit applications. CDEs are community development entities. These are a, um, a, a motley crew of folks who range from big multinational money center banks like J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo and U.S. Bank and PNC. We have CDEs. We put in applications. There's folks like Stonehenge who are on the for-profit side. There are nonprofits like the Local Initiative Support Corporation and the Enterprise Foundation. It is a wide variety. There are folks who serve just a city or just a county or just a tri-county area. There are folks that serve a state, a region, or serve nationally. And there's no real rhyme or reason as to who the CDEs are or how it's allocated. There's no formula per state. There's no special sort of set aside other than the Gulf Zone during Hurricane Katrina that was set aside and some other allocations for rural partners. But 
by and large, this is a wide variety of folks, and there's, what's the average, how many allocacies a year, 70? 70, 70, 70, yeah. around 70 a year. That number shifts a little bit too, year to year, but let's call it 70 on average every year get an award. There's many, many more than that that apply every year. I think the oversubscription was six to one last year. Seven to one? Seven to one last year. So it's competitive. It's real competitive. So those are the folks that would do only Kentucky deals, but they're not the only ones who would do Kentucky deals. Does that make sense? So they're your local folks, but there are folks, lots of folks, including us, who have done transactions here who are not Kentucky-based, right? There's a national pool of allocation, just like there's a regional and a state pool that projects get financed out of. So these applications go in, they're thick, and they're complicated, and they're time-consuming. They go in, they're scored. Like six to eight months later, the awards come out uh, without a whole lot of clarity as to how the winners and losers were picked, but awards are made. After the competitive round, the CDEs are effectively the fiduciaries of Treasury. Treasury picks them because of the application they wrote and entrusts them with a public good, which is the tax credit. And, you know, effectively the agreement made is you wrote us an application, we found it compelling, you will serve the nation in your footprint, deploying these credits in a way that reflects your pipeline, uh, and you're going to hold true to your application. And then they go out into the marketplace and find the projects that best fit that their focus. Um, the projects, once it's been qualified, typically an investor in the CDE will partner up, work together, and the deal that is made, the project wants the cash, the CDEs want to accomplish their mission and earn a fee for, for deploying these credits, and the bank wants the credits. So the CD or the bank buys the credits from the CDEs, the CDEs take that cash, subtract the fees that they want to earn on that allocation, and pass the cash down to the project to finance the community benefit that they're trying to achieve. The credit to the investor is a 39% tax credit. We'll go into that shortly. So it's 39% of the allocation amount. A $10 million deal would generate $3.9 million of tax credits that would be monetized, you know, somewhere around 80 to 83 cents. Uh, CDs traditionally provide loans to qualified businesses. I think we're going to go into quality definitions, so I don't want to take any more. To, to just to summarize on, on that slide right there real quick, um, so basically in short, uh, Stonehenge, a CDE, we have allocation, we find an investor such as Chase, they invest in the allocation, we end up becoming your project lenders. So uh, a lot of folks in the development side will want to get caught up on, well, where's the credit going and who's getting the credit? That's not always necessarily the case on the surface. I mean, we're happy to explain that and get into those details, but at the end of the day, a CDE has the credits, we allow an investor to invest in the credits, and then we become your project lender. So... Yeah, and that, that's a question we get from developers all the time is, how do we account for the credits? Well, you don't have to. You're getting the subsidized financing. Right. Yep. The credits are, again, that's just how this is fundamentally different from those other credits. It's not project generated. It's not the dollars you spend at your project. The credits exist at a level above your transaction. You get the financing. You're not generating the tax credits. And eight out of ten press releases, that's a statistic I just made up, is, is wrong. <laughs> When you, when you read a press release, it looks like the project received the tax credits, and that's not really the case in new markets. So this is, this is where I'm going to hand off. This is an interesting slide just to show you the contiguous states around you. This is designated by Qualified Low-Income Community Investment by State, which is really those loans that are made to the project. So this sort of shows you um, the dynamic. Ohio's done extremely well. Kentucky's done very well as well. You know, there's a huge swing. What generates this is complicated, right? There, it, it's a function of developers out there seeking the resource, professionals that are in the market sort of brokering the deals, applications that get put in for credits locally, which tend to anchor and draw in more credits into the marketplace, um, whether or not there's a state-based incentive that complements the federal credit and draws more resources in. Um, I, mean, I don't think there's one single... Um, silver bullet that you could point to that, that decides whether or not a state's successful in attracting credit, but um, this gives you the lay of the land. So with that, I will hand off. Um, but moving on, I guess now we're kind of, we're kind of after kind of giving you a, a brief introduction of kind of the history of the credit, um, now kind of how does it apply to you all here? Um, and just maybe even back up briefly, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Stephen LeBlanc. I'm with uh, Stonehenge Capital or Stonehenge Community Development. 
We are a CDE that's based in Ohio, and we actually have a national footprint. So I, I like Aaron, um, also originate, structure, and close transactions, and I'll work for, for seven years alongside the deal to act as an asset manager effectively. So we're kind of taking things soup to nuts. Um, it's my job to work with Aaron, uh, to work with John and Jim, to kind of bring everyone together, you know, put the transaction, all its parties at the table, and, and effectively close the deal. So, um, so, so with that, we're now going to move into kind of the, how this works for everyone here. And really the first thing, anytime we get a phone call, the first question somebody's going to ask you is, what's the address? Well, usually when you're in new construction, you don't have an address yet. Okay, that's fine. What's the, uh, is there like a, a shoe store or a fast food restaurant across the street from your project site? Because if that's the case, we can look that up, get, you know, kind of the address that's going to be in a census tract which I'm not really sure how they draw those, but uh, I believe it's population driven. Um, so basically what we're looking at is the census tracts, not address, I mean, not, not address specific or zip codes or area codes, it's a census tract. And so um, what we can do, and there, there's resources out there to, to look up a specific address. And we actually have a lot of stuff set up outside of the lobby so that they have projects that you want to check on And so, so, so Novogratic, which is the, the accounting firm that's here today, they actually, on, on their site, it's, it's basically a Google map overlay, where basically if you can use the Google map function, you can use this, and it tells you whether or not your project qualifies. However, I would still suggest uh, reaching out to, you know, a CDE or an investor just to make sure you're reading a map correctly. Um, a lot of folks will kind of get pretty far down the path, and then you have to tell them their project doesn't qualify. They yell, scream, and curse me like I drew the line. Not the case. But, uh, but for, for some reason, that's just kind of what happens. Um, you know, the, the qualification is based around the poverty rate and the average median family income. Uh, I wouldn't expect anyone in this room to actually know the poverty rate of the census tract in which they live in. That's why we have these wonderful mapping tools and, and informational resources that we can tell you whether or not your area is going to qualify. So uh, what, what a low-income community or a LIC uh, there's more acronyms in new markets than any other uh, tax credit program. I think Ron, Ron here actually has gone through this process, probably with a couple others here. Uh, we're actually not speaking in, in, in acronym today, so uh, we're trying to keep it, you know, kind of high level. Uh, but the low-income community is typically going to have a poverty rate greater than 20% or an AMI less than 80%. And so what that means is you should probably use the mapping software outside, figure out if your project location is in an area that qualifies. Um, if not, you can try to use a, a, a you know, another map to find, a, you know, something that's adjacent to your project site. And uh, this, is, this is pretty much what it looks like. This is actually from the Novogratic mapping site. And as you can see, you just basically put your, your address there in the yellow bar, hit enter, and then it's going to tell you whether or not it qualifies. And so right now where we're sitting today is where that yellow pin is. So what, what we're sitting in is actually known as a highly distressed census tract. Uh, there's kind of various, you know, degrees of, of qualification, uh, one being not qualified, qualified or highly distressed. A lot of groups uh, will submit their application to serve highly distressed communities, and so that's what the red is. Uh, the yellow qualifies, and then the gray does not. Um, typically, when, when people hear the word low-income community or distressed area, they automatically just have one thing in their mind, and they think of that neighborhood. It isn't always the case in new markets. A lot of times you can be pretty surprised what will qualify. Um, you know, 39% of Jefferson County qualifies, 28% of Bullitt County qualifies, and 22% of Shelby County qualifies. And that's kind of on a, you know, kind of lo looking at all the census tracts as a whole. Um, actually, I think 40% of all the census tracts in the U.S. qualify. So there's decent opportunity out there. Um, there actually is another way if – we're not going to go into the target population, but in the event that your project does not qualify um, in this map, there's another way we can look at it. Uh, we don't necessarily enjoy doing it. It's more of a compliance burden on, you know, on the CDE, the investor, and the accountants, and the borrowers. So typically we're not going to go there, but it is called targeted population. I feel like I have to say that. Otherwise, I'm not really representing the facts. So focus um, on the map. Yeah, focus on the focus map. Focus on the map. And yeah. ideally, you're in the red area. If so, yeah, and it's a target yeah. population looks more like the low-income housing deals, where it's sort of based on the income of the resident. This would be in, based on the income of the customers or the. Red, red is good. Yep. Red is good. Red is great. Yeah. Red is the highly distressed, which is sometimes groups won't even 
I mean, some groups will only serve a, a red area, a highly distressed. So, yeah, I mean, what, without going into too much detail, as this application has gotten more and more competitive, people have sort of signed up for deeper and deeper targets. And so I think it's safe to say that probably 98% uh, um, will only do deals in highly distressed. So the 80-20 test he was talking about doesn't really, I mean, that's sort of the, that's the treasury bar. But there's a whole CFI bar now based on the application. That and the industry bar. Yeah, industry bar. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look for red. Yeah. And then the other thing, which I don't think it picks up, John, but, uh, the, you know, rural versus metro. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, have it's on there? I think we have it. Because um, a, a lot of groups also have a requirement to serve a rural area. So I guess a few years ago, the rural census tracts or the rural area said, you know what, not enough of the subsidies coming into our area. We want, some, we want some of this. And so now groups will serve only rural areas. And so, again, you, you can, as Aaron mentioned, you need to woo the CD as part of the wooing process. And we'll go into that in a little bit. But, but that's something that I believe is it might be in the details of the map. And so if you're in a, what you think is a rural area, it may be. But, again, it's, you know, if you call me, I can tell you this is what I do all day long. So we can tell you pretty quickly. So um, what are the kind of project types that we can do? Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of times I find myself saying no. Um, if it sounds like it's too much fun, uh, golf courses, gambling, racetracks, which is obviously a big industry here. Um, you know, a, a distillery could be could be pretty rocky whether or not that's going to work. Um, but, uh, you know, t the typical things you would think of, a hotel development's big, uh, mixed-use retail, real estate development, operating businesses are attractive right now, manufacturing companies. Uh, you can do obviously nonprofits, industrial type projects are eligible as well. Um, grocery stores, that's another kind of, uh, you know, kind of a, I guess it's a more single focused area that CDs will pursue as well. Um, so if there's grocery stores out there that are going to relocate into food deserts per se, that's something that can be attractive as well. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, kind of the, the ineligible stuff, uh, spas, suntan facilities, that's not going to work. Um, farming activity also is restricted. And then the residential rental property, which I think we get into in a little bit, uh, there's a kind of a, a test there you have to, yeah, I think it's a real estate slide, uh, that, that you have to kind of, that you have to pass. Um, there's obviously other subsidies and credits available for housing. So what this tries to do is, you know, tries to not allow people to use multiple subsidies in one project. So effectively, if you're going to do a project that has a housing component, you know, with it, then you need to generate 20% of the project's revenue through commercial space. And that commercial space may be a ground level grocer, uh, a second level of commercial retail, class A office space, class B, whatever, or other type of services with the other five floors generating 75% probably, 75% of the revenues through kind of condos, if you will. So uh, I think we touch into that in a little bit more. Again, this program is about if it's not on that list, you, you can do it, right? This, not like Light Tech, not like Historic. You can do virtually anything with this except for the things that you can't do, which is very different from the other sort of incentives for real estate or other operating businesses. Right. It just needs to be a business in the right place. Right. So typically, if I've received a phone call, and we're talking through this, and so far I think your project is in a, low, you know, in a qualified census tract, and I'm probably checking that while we're talking. And you're not going to open up a spa or a suntan facility. We're still talking. And then we're going to get into maybe something a little bit more granular. And this is kind of, you know, what I would kind of call the quality B determination. Basically what this test is about is, one, we check the project location. So that qualifies. You're not a non-qualified business. So then you step into kind of the final step. And what we're trying to kind of ensure here is that the project is actually going to have uh, an impact on the low-income community. So we want to ensure that a certain percent of the gross income, the property, and the services performed are actually going to take place inside of that area. Because what we don't want to do is just have a refrigerator company come in, build its, you know, kind of facility where it's going to park its trucks at night, and then go and service all the high-end homes, you know, kind of in the, you know, it, around Louisville and kind of travel, and then come back to park their trucks at night. That isn't the idea of the program. The intention of the program is to put that business there, for it again, for, for it to kind of begin to revitalize the area, create the jobs, create the foot traffic to bring other people into it. Um, and then again, this is something that 
uh, that Nova Gratic uh, and, and the CDEs will typically kind of get into. Um, but there are ways that we can uh, kind of help structure around some of these issues if that's a concern. Um, that's obviously kind of like the new markets 301 course, which we're not having today. <laughs> um, but Nova Gratic has that for you yeah. if you want to uh, if you want to attend the webinar. Yeah. So it uh, just depends. Yeah. Let me just summarize that real quick. So. It's, it's really where the business is. So where a business is is where its assets are, where its employees are actually doing the work, and, um, and uh, where its sales are coming from, which is sort of a function of where its assets are and where its employees are doing the work. And so, um, you know, when you get into sort of, I don't know, some of your businesses, you get into sort of state nexus issues. It's like, am I really doing business in that different state and things like that? It's sort of the same sort of, um, thought process is where, where your business is. And so there are certain tests in the regs that we look at, but most of the investor community feel comfortable when you're doing something with a lot of hard assets that are going to stay put because there's this sort of safe harbor that says if 75% of your assets are, are um, in this zone, then um, you're there, regardless of where your employees are in everything else, or if you don't have any employees. And so real estate has sort of become the, the investment of choice. And even when you're doing operating businesses or financing them, a lot of times you're financing their real estate and maybe leasing to them or, you know, so that we can be sure that this stays in a qualified track and there's no recapture issues at the end of the day. So For heavy equipment. We, we like bricks and mortar yeah. and heavy equipment. Stuff yeah. that you buy, go someplace, and stays there. Right, yeah. Good. Uh, so I guess now this is kind of before we move any further um, to kind of explain how everyone, I guess, you know, how Stites and Harbison and Jim and Jamie and myself and uh, Nova Gratic and Chase work together. This is kind of another slide that we put together that we think is important for you to understand. Um, basically, this black line is kind of the transaction in itself. Um, and what, what you see in the transaction is you have the investor, Chase, in this situation. You have Stonehenge, the CDE. And then you have the Qualic B, which is the borrower. Uh, that's a, a qualified active low-income community business. Again, we're trying not to speak an acronym here. Um, and what you see kind of the dotted line is it's in a low-income community. So those are kind of the base level um, participants in a transaction. And then you're going to have legal counsel for each one of those parties. Again, you're no, most likely not going to have Stacks and Harbison on all three sides of the deal. But that's more than object. But yeah, probably not object, but we'd have to have some conflict waivers and whatnot. <laughs> so, but, but what that's supposed to tell you is that I, I believe Stacks and Harbison would represent all three parties uh, or can represent each party in the transaction. Is that right, Jim? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the idea, right? I mean... <laughs> Well, no, but I'm saying what you can. I mean, you guys will, will represent CDs, investors, and but what you'll have in, in, in each transaction is you also have uh, Nova Gratic. Um, there are, and, and again, there are other CDEs and there are other investors, so there are other accountants and other law firms. There are? Um, yeah, I think, I've heard. But, uh, but basically, Nova Gratic will prepare uh, a, a, a very comprehensive model to show the various uh, kind of flows of cash amongst the various entities that'll end up in the transaction. Uh, they'll also ensure our structure is per the regulations. Hopefully, we've already done that. Uh, again, we being Aaron and myself, as we're kind of the originators there, we should have already taken care of that. However, typically, uh, John and Rob will make sure that we've done that and we can document it. So, uh, what you also, you, you can have in a transaction, and it's got a dotted line, because you won't have it in every deal, is you'll have a consultant. Um, and there's consultants all over the country, as everywhere, um, and as any consulting firm, as I'm sure you've all kind of come across them. Some are great, some maybe not so great. Um, however, if this is kind of a first time going through a transaction, and you know you're a nonprofit and you're not very financially sophisticated, it may not be a bad idea to, to bring a consultant on. Uh, it's definitely a large network. I don't know if you have any thoughts about consultants, but um, they're, they're instrumental to bring I have no thoughts about consultants. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I have a follow-up document. Sure. Uh, let's say that we're trying to get $2 million. Okay. How much of the $2 million will we lose to your consulting fees? Good question. Um, it, it, it depends. I mean, it it's a again, huge range. A nice range. Yeah, I'd say if, if you take a $100 allocation, 
the credit's worth 39 cents on that $100, right? And your, your subsidy at the end of the day is going to be between 15 and 20, let's say. Closer to 15, you know. But by the time you pay all your fees and the whole bit, so. $39 that they give out. 39%. You said $100. $39 in credits. Yeah. Yeah, $39. I thought I said 39%, but maybe I didn't. But anyway, so that's right. Yeah, yeah. So I always just look at it that way. Yeah, and I mean, and, and that's something that's, you know, on $2 million, on, on two million bucks, you're going to be less than 400 grand. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that's something but that's two million bucks is kind of small. And, and, and that's obviously, a, you know, a, a big question in these, you know, tax credit deals. A lot of people here, you know, will, will ask kind of, well, what, what do the fees look like? And that's something that, pe that we can talk about. Um, you know, it's probably, it, it's going to depend on the transaction. Uh, and that's usually kind of a, a project-specific conversation that we have. It's not something really to get in here. But, I mean, you, you can see that, you know, there is at least a minimum three legal parties to represent the three parties in the transaction. However, if you've been a part of these deals and you start adding historic tax credits and, you, you add state new markets tax credits to it, and you add, uh, you know, a, a debt investor into the deal, you can start to add various parties, which will, will incur additional fees. So um, this is kind of, a, again, a baseline structure. Uh, however, I have not, unfortunately, been a part of many baseline structures lately. Uh, I'm not sure if it's just some sort of curse or um, it's just kind of the, the way in which we see deals now where people are bringing together various forms of financing and the more complicated the deal, the more expensive and the more parties you can add to the transaction. So at the end of the day, like just setting up a conference call can somewhat be like a, an exercise in itself. Hi, I'm John Ceretti. I'm with Novograd and Company and we are primarily a tax credit accounting firm and we work in all the tax credits. Low income housing was sort of the genesis of our firm and, and then we moved into these, to these other credit programs like historic tax credits. Um, energy tax credits and new market tax credits. Um, I primarily work in the new market and historic and energy areas. Uh, and new markets, we help people apply for credits, so we'll help help um, CDs actually make their application and write applications for the CDs. And then once they receive allocation, our rule normally our rule normally is to help them structure the deal. So we'll come up with the financial model that sort of works from an economic as well as regulatory perspective. And then once the deal is closed, um, we do audit and tax work around the different entities in the structure. And then on the back end, we usually help consult through the exit from a tax perspective as well. So so that's what we do. Um, I brought with me Rob Bryan, who um, does all the work. <laughs> <laughs> all the work, no credit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And Rob is a manager in our office, and uh, he primarily works in the same areas that I do. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about structure. They can get pretty complicated, but the basic structure, when you look at this, and we sort of been talking about where, how the credit is earned, um, the community development entity, and you'll hear people throw around CDE, that, that's the entity in the middle there that has received the allocation. So they went out and made application and got an award for some sort of amount of credits. Um, I think the average... Um, used to be around 50 million. Was that the wow. well, it's now it's last couple of rounds it's been diluted a little bit, but um, and they might you know give say 10 million to a transaction. So a lot of times if you have a 20 million dollar transaction, you have to club two together or three. So it gets a little more complicated, a little more expensive. Everybody has an attorney, and but it's hard. You know, CDs usually don't want to give up. You know. 50% of their allocation on one deal. They like to diversify a bit. And John, we should we should draw the difference between allocation and credits, which I don't think. Yeah, I will here. Okay, yep. yep. awesome. I will here. Yeah, yeah. I know. I'll get there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Put me along. Put me along. So the credits generated when they put the equity investment into the big box there, right? And so if you put um, $100 in, you get $39 of credits out. That's basically what it is. And, and maybe we'll, we'll use millions because it's say a $10 million, $3.9 million would be your credits. Well, um, and so um, I think the vision of this program initially was, hey, let's have a conduit to, to loan through to where we can sort of subsidize the interest rate. And so because the government's going to give you this 39% credit, which doesn't have it in one year, by the way, it comes over seven years, okay? And so discounted, it might be worth $0.30, cents, and, you know, you get... So you're getting, you know, 
five 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 uh, six 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 six. That's the the percentage across the seven years. So it's almost like it's a subsidy of the interest rate. We can offer a lower rate that the people that have a harder time to start up businesses or people in low income communities that might warrant a higher rate, and it subsidizes the rate. And that sort of I think was where it, where the program the vision it started with. And and so the simple structure would be that you know a bank comes in makes an equity investment in the CDE. The CDE makes the choice of where they're going to put the money, and it's it's a subsidized rate for the bank. So the bank might be charging, you know, seven percent at, at the top, but by because they're getting the credit, they can charge, you know, maybe four percent or something of that nature. Okay, to to the to the qualified business. Well, this was sort of laid over. This program was kind of, even though it doesn't look like the housing credit, it was kind of laid over the housing credit industry. You know, community development, that was housing, right? Everybody sort of used to buying credits and not really having a whole lot of risk other than recapture risk. So the banks kind of looked at this and said, what do you mean? If I give you 100 bucks, you're only going to give me 39 cents back? You know, I'm used to giving you 80 cents and getting 100 back, and there's really not a whole lot of risk here, you know? And so um, we went to Treasury, and we were part of this, our firm, and we said, okay, can we, can we bifurcate this structure where we have two investors where we have this sort of equity investor that maybe comes in here and, and makes a loan, and we couple that with, you know, a tax credit investor where they can start looking like they're buying housing credits almost, where they're paying 80 cents on the dollar and getting their credit. And IRS came back and said, no, we're not going to we're gonna feel comfortable where you could sort of bifurcate that partnership with two, two classes of investors, one, one with cash and one with credits. But we'll, we will let you do what we call the leverage structure, and that's, that's mostly – what you see today is this structure, where you have this leverage lender has the economic risk in the structure, and it's usually roughly 70% of the cash that's in this box, okay? And then these tax credit investors can come in and put their 30 cents in and get 39 cents back. So now that starts looking like the housing deal that, you know, that they're used to, where they sort of get a return and all the only risk they have is tax credit risk and not economic risk. And that leverage lender could be a whole different source, and we're going to kind of get into that. But still, they they combine those two sources of cash, one from the lender, you know, 70 from the lender, 30 from the investor. They make that qualified equity investment, let's say $10 million. That's where the credit's generated, 39%, $3.9 million. Over seven years, might only be worth about $3 million to them. And so that's that's where you lose a part of this $0.39 cents because the bank's got to make a return, right? And then once it hits the the magic box there, then that community development entity makes these sort of loans or equity investments to the projects that we're talking about. And that's why the project, you know, these these can get really complicated. You can get a whole lot of boxes, a lot of CDs. We can mix other subsidy, which we're going to talk about. And the, the developer is really just looking up with this big web, hoping a fly drops down at the end of the day, you know. But it's, it's yeah, it, it, is, it is sort of the, the top of the structure really is not um, the responsibility of the developer like it would be in a housing deal or a historic tax credit deal or something of that nature. Okay, okay so this this part here is kind of showing how we're getting how much equity that the tax credit investor is actually going to give to us. So uh, we're using a $10 million allocation example uh, up here in the slide. So you're going to go to a CDE such as uh, Stephen here, and they're going to award you $10 million of allocation for your project. Well, the $10 million of allocation of, is going to uh, create a 39% tax credit. And then we have uh, Aaron over here with the investor side, and they're going to come and pay, instead of a dollar for the tax credit, like John was talking about with the discounted factor, they're going to pay, say, $0.78 cents for this tax credit. And it might be anywhere today between 75 and 85 That's kind of kind of where the I'd see the pricing, at least in my desk, you know. So, <laughs> and maybe Eric can kind of talk, because, you know, some deals are more attractive to banks, and they'll, they'll pay a little more for them. I thought it was the 60s. Though. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Does pricing kind of mirror YPEC? No. No. Uh, other than CRA is, CRA is something that we look at in this industry, but CRA does not drive this industry like it does in LIHTC. 
um, to nearly to that extent. Now, I mean, if you had some fifty million dollar new market deal in like in the Bronx or something, or like in downtown Dallas, some, some really really hot or like in Salt Lake City, um, some hot CRA market like that, you might see a premium on that. But size of transactions probably going to drive pricing more than anything else. With CRA being a secondary um, consideration, you know, and that's within the mainstream, right? There might be some community bank or regional bank or somebody who is real upside down on an assessment area that might swoop in and, you know, buy up some deal just to check a box. But generally, the market dynamic isn't driven like Litech is. Two quick questions. Did it fluctuate as much like Litech has in the last four or five years? No, we've been, I think we've been much more stable and on, a, on, a, on an increasing pricing trajectory as opposed to this. There's been no T-cap sort of, you know, through the floor, bottoming out. No, we've been very steady. Yes. Yes. The, the one thing I guess I'll, I'll go back and well, when we get to the when we get to the big slide, I'll, I'll talk about. That. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. So now, now that we've got the pricing down and we see how much money that the tax credit investor is going to bring to the transaction, the project now has to go out and fill the remainder of the allocation to funnel through the project. So instead of going out and say your project is ten million dollars taking out a $10 million bank loan. Now you go out and you have to take out a $7 million bank loan to fill the funnel, and it decreases the amount of debt on your project, which helps a lot of commercial lenders, I believe, with their loan to values. They don't like to, they don't like to lend 100% of the project. So you go out and you say, well, I can subsidize, which this is a gross new market tax credit equity. This isn't the net that the project's going to get. There is CD fees, legal fees, and et cetera, that will come out of the subsidy. But just from filling the funnel, you go out and tell the bank, uh, I, only, I only need $7 million instead of $10 million. They're going to feel a little bit more comfortable because their loan to value is only 70% instead of 100%. Right. Yeah. I mean, you see, you know, it's like equity. You're trading off the top of the rest of the tax credit investor at the top of the structure versus equity at the bottom. So, yeah. so you want me to switch it? Yep. So the next slide kind of shows what I was just talking about. Now you have to go out and you have to fill the, fill the funnel. So now you have to go out and find the 6.95 million or round up to seven. And uh, there are many different forms of leverage. Uh, it's not only traditional debt from a commercial lender. Uh, you can have grants. Uh, a lot of nonprofits get grants that they use to fill the funnel. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit because um, the program has, what well, I think is a very big limitation in that the, the leverage lender, what we're talking about, this this economic investor I referred to him as, or the, the leverage lender. I mean, as a developer, you can think, oh, I can just put my loan through that structure, and yeah, this is great, you know, it works. Well, the program, um, whenever they gave us this great revenue ruling that said we could bifurcate economics from tax credits, they they put a little uh, non-recourse word in the, in the revenue ruling. And so, as far as tax council is concerned, that means that that debt cannot secure, can, cannot have collateral in the project itself. I mean, the, the, the ruling led us down that road that we couldn't have collateral in the project itself. How many so commercial remember, lenders are here? Remember, remember what? Show of hands, seriously. Okay. How many commercial lenders? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so this guy here, oh, there's a little thing there. Okay, so this guy here, this is your 70 cent guy, right? So if you were just going to go out and get, say you had to, do this ten million dollar deal, and you had you know a million dollars of equity, and you could only get, um, and you can only get seven million dollars of uh, of debt from the bank, and you need a two million dollar subsidy, and so he said, this is great. I can just put my seven million dollars of debt up here, right, and my two million dollars. I, you know, I can bring into the project, and, or I mean, one million I can bring in here as equity, and the tax credit investor is going to fill my gap to two million bucks, right? Well, the problem is they can't. This lender can't have security, so it's really difficult to get a lender to, um, you know, put their money in the top, and, and it gets a little worse because they also are asked to forbear from foreclosure by this guy because he wants his tax credits for seven years. If there's a foreclosure, because they're, if their only if their only security is this investment into here. Then a foreclosure means they would get the tax credits, right? And this guy's out. And so there's a forbearance agreement. So it's really tough to get a lender to agree to that situation unless 
your lender and your investor are the same entity. Okay. So you see a whole lot of soft money in these deals. Okay. And I think that's what Rob. Well, that, that or, or the lender is actually lending to say a parent company who operates. Yeah. Other securities. You can cross collateralize, yeah. but you can't have direct collateral in your project. So you can cross collateralize. Um, you know, you can you can collateralize cash flow. You know, depending on who your tax account yeah. is. And, you know. But you know, and there's you know, so there's some creative stuff you can do, and we've worked through some of the stuff. But the traditional debt mortgage deal doesn't work. Okay. And so. A lot of times that $2 million of equity I was talking about, it wouldn't go in the bottom. It would go in the top, and you got to go find another million. Maybe that's a grant. Maybe that's, uh, you know, if you're a nonprofit and do a lot of nonprofit things, maybe they're charitable contributions from, you know, from your sources. Um, but the other thing we see a lot, what we do a lot of, is we, we leverage other tax credits. And so we do what you would call a twin deal. So you have this historic new markets deal, and the historic equity looks like, the leverage, you know, and so your investors buy them at the top and that money sort of working its way down through this funnel to help leverage the new market side. And state credit's the same way. You can go out and buy, you know, do a state credit deal and the state credit equity can help leverage the federal credit equity. And so there's a lot of creative things and this is where it gets very complicated because you're working with all the different rules and trying to meet all the different tests and you got a whole lot of boxes and it, you know, and you really need people like us to help you out to do this. <laughs> no, but that's, that's what we do. So, so it, it's a lot of fun for us, but it, it can be pretty, uh, it could, it could be pretty discouraging at times, I guess. And, and, uh, you know, developers, um, you know, I guess you have to have a lot of trust at the end of the day that it, that it all, all makes sense. So. All right, Rob, if you want to. Yeah, just one more point that I want to show on that slide is, uh, that these sources are required at the day of closing. The money has to actually funnel through uh, the actual structure. Mm -hmm. So I just want to point that out on the slide. All right, so let's talk, let's let's look at this. This is basically what we've been talking about the whole time, okay? And so, but one thing I just maybe just sort of walk down through. So this is where you sort of get okay. If this is a ten million dollar deal and we have seventy cents and thirty cents, right? The, the first layer of fees kind of goes to the investor. Okay, because the, that they need nine of the of the thirty nine to get a return because that nine doesn't come in year one; it comes over seven years. Okay, so you know they're looking for nothing huge, five percent returns, you know, and so you know four percent returns at times, depending on what price they're paying for the credits. By the time you present value that money over over the seven years, and like I say, a lot of times they're in the eighty cents that they're buying. It, when it, when that when then so when the money hits here, this ten million now ten million doesn't go from here to. Here. Well, ten million hits here. Ten million goes in here to generate credit, and then it doesn't necessarily go ten here to here because this guy here has to get paid for everything they've done, right? They went out and applied for credits. They got to keep people employed. They have to do all the compliance. They have to underwrite the loans. They have to travel and see businesses and all the things that they do, all their expenses. They have to, they have, to have a source of revenue, and so they charge fees. Okay, and so right here you, you'll get a fee. Sometimes there's a fee up here. Sometimes there's a fee here. And then there's you got to pay your attorneys to close the deal, and you got to pay your accountants, and there's ongoing compliance expenses. So maybe that thirty cents that's left becomes twenty cents, okay? And maybe even maybe sometimes when you look at the whole thing, it might you know it might be a little less than twenty cents, but fifteen to twenty some of theirs ends up inuring to the to the project, okay? So that's kind of the structure. Now the, now the kicker is that this here can be debt or equity, okay? Equity is great. If I can make it equity, at the end of the day, it looks like a housing deal. I just my investor pay my investor to go away, and, you know, I keep equity in my partnership. There's no real tax issues um, because, until I liquidate the partnership, which might be 20 years, 30 years down the road, okay? In the new markets, um, there's some problems with equity because there's always there's control issues without getting to so much of the detail. that you really, as this guy here, can't control this guy here in a general sense, which a lot of you know, which is like they can't have most of the capital. And a lot of times these are real thin deals. There's not a whole lot of deals. There's not a whole lot of equity coming in down here at the bottom from another source. Okay, the equities, if you make, might, this might be your only equity, and that can't happen. You can't have more than 50% of the equity in in the project. So most of the time it's dead. And what happens at the end of this structure is there's a put up here. Okay. 
to get that investor to go away. So this guy here that has the project buys out the investor here. And in the tax world, when you do that, you own your own debt. And in the tax world, that's a debt forgiveness event. Okay? So at that point in time, that 30 cents that he gave me is now income in seven years. Okay? So it's a little different, like I say, than a housing deal. And there's some things that you can do to sort of structure around that. Um, but, you know, they're not, they're not foolproof. And so there is some risk. So, so even at the end of the day, that subsidy could be taxable. Like all subsidy, everything's always taxable. It's just in the other credits you might be used to where it's equity, it's not taxable until you liquidate it because I don't have any basis in what that investor gave me. And so when I liquidate my partnership, I'm going to have tax. This is a forced liquidation in seven years. So just kind of keep that in mind. Which is why I said $7 million for for profits because by the time you go through the fees and expenses and you liquidate that at the end of a seven-year period and pay tax on that, that your net benefit is, is modest generally. So, but, I mean, you know, for, for, what, for what it's worth, a lot of groups that we talk to, you know, they understand that, uh, you know, right now they need the cash to, to expand their facility or whatever they're going to do or we, we need the cash to build the new facility. Great. And then in seven years, the idea is that we're, we're going to put this money into circulation now, and then in seven years, ideally, they're benefiting because what – I'm not sure if you mentioned or not, but, but that A and the B loan are going to be interest only. And so, uh, I, you know, there's typically not going to be any amortization uh, on both those notes. And so your business should actually benefit from having this interest only loan for seven years. So ideally, at the seventh year when we go to exit, the taxable event shouldn't be that substantial – to their operations. Yeah, I mean, there's still, I mean, obviously, there's tons more demand for these things than there is supply. There's a huge benefit if you can get credits. It's just, we're just saying these things to help you understand that it's not necessarily 30 cents, you know. It, it's going to be a little less than that. So this is the first case study. That, this is a deal that we did with Stonehenge that we closed a couple months ago called Detroit Thermal Systems. It's an operating business. So when I said we could do anything, right, except the things that we can't do, a good example. This is not a real estate deal. Uh, it's an equipment change deal. So manufacturing company, minority-owned business in Detroit, startup creating significant jobs in the metro Detroit area. Um, we were brought in with Stonehenge um, and a consultant put together a nice size transaction for it. We put in some of our own allocation, five million from Chase, five million from a city called Urban, it's Urban America. No, it is Urban Atlantic. Yeah, and then Stonehenge put in $10 million, and what we ended up financing was equipment for this business. It was um, um, some operating equipment or um, um, working capital, and then really the acquisition of some uh, injection molders. So big, heavy equipment, right, big capital spend. The leverage for this deal came from the parent's ability. It was a JV. The parent had cash, right? The parent had cash, but not enough cash to run them through their first operating cycle. The new markets provided that subsidy to get them through their first operating cycle, turn that first product and get them into operation. So they use their own parent balance sheet to provide the 70 cents of leverage onto our 30 cents of equity. Nice deal. I mean, really nice deal. But, but the way the, the Stonehenge sees this deal, and again, remember, back to the wooing comment, that's just such a, a good word. Uh, we were wooed by this deal due to the job creation. So Stonehenge has a, uh, a very heavy emphasis on job creation. And so what we're looking for is really – 10 million jobs, excuse me, uh, 10 jobs per kind of, you know, $1 million of allocation. That's just Stonehenge. Every group is going to have its own unique kind of box in which it's looking to kind of fill with the various kind of impacts of the project. And that's something to keep in mind. Just because you have a deal and it qualifies, you still have to kind of get a CDE on board with you to make the investment. And this job in itself created 166 new jobs direct to that facility. Uh, so we found that to be, uh, you know, a, a great benefit of this project. So we didn't do this deal. Yeah. Yeah, sure. This was a deal that, that, uh, that Stonehenge worked with, uh, with U.S. Bank. Um, basically, this was the rehabilitation of the Stewart, Stewart's Dry Good Building um, in, what, in what will be a, uh, an embassy suite hotel. This is probably the closest deal to where we're sitting today. I think it's right over there. Uh, this was kind of on the upper limits we were talking about. Um, this is a kind of a, a deal that um, we are partnering. It's, it's a joint venture between Eric Batchelor uh, and uh, the Schneider Company, who Ron Schrecker was just here. 
um, where U.S. Bank was our investor. Uh, he's still here. And um, and also we had USBNA, uh, Bob Ogburn's here as well, provide a, uh, a construction loan to the project. This deal also had state new markets tax credits in it um, as well as historic tax credits. So this was one where we added some boxes and some arrows. So that little diagram we saw earlier, it didn't really look like that when we got done with it. So um, it was a deal that we worked with Nova Braddock on. Um, they were instrumental in getting it done, uh, given the complexity of it and the moving pieces. Uh, however, this is a deal that we saw, uh, you know, kind of fit our mission, given the fact that it's in a, in a highly distressed area in downtown Louisville. Uh, it's going to create 200 new jobs and begin to really kind of extend 4th Street Live into a newer area, which is still distressed. And so we're hoping that, you know, kind of our investment will begin to kind of redevelop, uh, I guess that's the, I'm not sure that's the north or the south end of 4th Street. What was this? Done? Yeah, and just an interesting statistic on this. 27.5% of the project was paid for via tax credit subsidy, albeit historic, federal historic, state, and federal and market tax credit. And it was complicated to get them all married together. Yeah. The flow chart was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> for those of us who love that guy. Yeah, I, I like that kind of stuff. <laughs> this is the third deal. This was a deal that, I mean, basically between sites and, um, and, um, their partners on the consulting side, Jeff Speaks and a couple other folks, I mean, made this deal happen. This is the rebuild, Morgan County. I mean, everybody's familiar with Morgan County and the, and the tornado that came through West Liberty. Uh, this is actually one of two deals, a sister deal that we, we partnered with U.S. Bank on to fund um, a health and wellness center, the rebuild of the historic courthouse, and then their community center. Brought in allocates from around the country, including ourselves, and Pay Center, which is just over the border in Virginia. Uh, to pull this deal together, all soft sources, FEMA dollars, insurance proceeds, all kinds of things. I, mean, I think when uh, Jim first started working on this deal, he was like 25, and it was <laughs> spring chicken. He was real tired after that got done, but that was that was a year end closing, right? We got that done right before year end last year. It was uh, it was a tough deal to get done, but really impactful, really impactful project. You know, this is a traditional real estate type deal, right? Bricks and mortar, uh, you know, sort of community impact, not so much from a job creation standpoint, but from a community revitalization, rebuilding a devastated area. So those are good examples of projects that I got done. Uh, who's supposed to do the summary? I guess I will. Uh, so the summary, it, it, new markets, it's gap fill, right? It's gap fill. It's not going to finance your whole deal. It's going to finance... 15 to 20 percent of it, maybe more if you can stack additional credits on it. Flexible fact, financing terms, you're not going to get hung up on things like, typically, you're not going to get hung up on things like loan to value or debt coverage ratios or things like that with new markets. Your deal's got a pencil. It's not going to make a bad deal good. It's going to make a marginal deal better. Um, new markets, what we like to see, job creation. Expansion in low-income areas, community revitalization, retack, re attract and retain businesses in the local communities in here in Kentucky. Uh, projects must be located in qualified census tracts and very good for both nonprofits and for-profits. Doing both types of deals, you can do anything except for things that you can't. So the first question was fees. How do, how do fees, are they linear? Do they grow or shrink or get more efficient with the size of the deal? Second question was, can you, is there a look back period? Can you grab acquisition or costs that you've already incurred on a new market deal? Um, so for the first one, fees are a little sticky and it depends on what kind of fees you're talking about. Fees tend to be a function of the number of players that are in the deal, which tends to be the number of CDEs that are in a transaction. Each CDE is going to have their own layer of fees and they're going to have your, their own attorneys. Accounting firms tend to become more efficient as the deal gets bigger because there's one of them and that cost gets spread across a larger deal. But, you know, there's a new lawyer for every new player in the deal and there's a new fee scheme for every new CDE. So it, I think it's safe to say that the CDE fees are variable. Very they're always going to be variable, and so they're always going to be based on the amount of allocation you're using. So the CDE fees are linear. The, the closing cost, I think it's safe to say, will go down as the deal gets bigger. Not, not. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I wouldn't say it would be. It would be pro rata, but it would, you know, it would go down as, as the deal. Well, goes. there's probably diminishing returns on that, right? At some point, it gets unwieldy, right, and may, it may blow up bigger, yeah. depending on the number of players. I guess, I mean, I think it, always, it also depends, like, if you have a CDE 
that gives you 30 million versus, like you said, three CDs with 10 million, obviously the same deal is going to be more with multiple CDs because they all have their own attorney. But they do, they tend to do a nice job of using the same loan docs across all CDs. And, you know, so there's been a real push to try to make closing more efficient. And I think it's gotten more efficient. We have gotten years. much better. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's a competitive product, right? And so our fee structure is going to be different than another CD or another CD. And typically we're pretty, we're transparent about that. You're going to know what it is when you get into the deal. Um, here it is. Here's what we're going to do. However, the, you know, as you probably are aware, the attorney's fees can slide a little bit. We have a good idea of what, you know, certain firms can bill. And, you know, when we look at the structure, we can say it's going to be about X. But typically, you know, you're not going to get a hard number fr from a lawyer in these deals because, I mean, I've been a part of deals that have closed in 40 days. I've been a part of deals that have closed in nine months. So it just depends. Um, the biggest driver of closing costs are the borrower. The borrower is the driver of the closing costs. If you, in my opinion, as a guy who buys credit, if you try to swim upstream against how new markets gets done, and, and you know, we showed you that box, every new markets deal is different, but they all get done the same way. The same general structure is used, the same agreements, the same concepts. There are tweaks that we make around the edges, but, but swimming upstream against the way that new markets deals get done is what makes them expensive in my experience. And, that, and the other thing is all these deals, they're all different. It, it, there's no real canned sort of deal like there is in housing. Because in housing, you know, every deal sort of at some point looks the same. You know, you know, I mean, you have different layers of financing, but it's still a lot easier to sort of put to the project and going through a whole structure first and then get it to the project and sort of making it look like it didn't start from the project, but it ended up back over the project. And, and so it's it, it very complicated, but it's well worth it because at the end of the day, most of the deals wouldn't get done. They just it's like the only way, it's, you know, that they can get done. So. Second question you asked was on look back. So this industry is full of things that what you can do and what you will do. So generally speaking, yes, you can sort of look back. And the general rule of thumb in the industry is you could probably look back about 12 months and sort of reimburse costs that were incurred today, including acquisition costs. There's some restrictions and prohibitions around purely refinancing of transactions, which don't get done. But I will tell you, from a market dynamic, rarely do we see CDEs attracted to transactions that don't have a lot of new economic impact post-closing. If you came to me and said, I just built this fantastic facility right downtown here, uh, you know, we, we got it all built and it's up and running and it's humming along, bring me in some new market subsidy, I want to take a little equity off the table, you, see, you probably could find a way to get that deal done, you know, sort of under the rule of law, but whether or not you would actually, from a market perspective, be able to get that done, probably not. Honestly, so yeah, we do a lot of deals that are midstream, but it's always about making that argument, why do I need the subsidy? If you're already spending dollars and you're down the road, it makes it harder to make that case. Yeah, and just to add to that, kind of, kind of what, we're, what, what Aaron's talking about there is what, you know, for, for Stonehenge, we receive, you know, six of these federal awards, okay? Uh, what we're looking to do is in every application, we're going to tell the CDFI what we did with those credits. We want to be able to tell them that we put new brick and mortar, we created new direct jobs and everything else we have in our strategy. If we just go and just say, yeah, we refinanced a bunch of stuff that didn't really need the subsidy, the likelihood of us getting another allocation is probably not very good. Um, so just keep that in mind. I mean, what we're looking for is the best and brightest kind of, you know, project out there. Can you just talk briefly about um, – in seven years, what actually happens to unwind the deal? Yeah, sure. So at the end of the seven years, there, there, there's a put, there's a, when you close the deal, there's a put call um, option. And so the investor at the end of seven years can put his investment to basically the project or an affiliate of the project, the, the sponsor, um, normally for a very nominal fee, maybe $1,000. Most of the time it's $1,000. So they have that option to put their investment in the top of this structure, right? Which a lot of times it's, you know, they have the, the equity interest, but the debt, you know, there's still a liability there. So they're going to, they, at the end of the day, the value of, of that investment to them is normally maybe 10% of what they put in um, in the beginning. The count, and then, and then there's also a call option, okay? And the call option says that the, the sponsor can buy the investment from the investor for fair market value, which is this 10%. Typically, I mean, you don't know what it's going to be, right? It's, 10, it's seven years down the road, but 
when we're modeling the deal, we sort of model it to where the cash flows might equal maybe 10% of what that investors put in in the beginning. So that's sort of the risk from a sponsor, project sponsor, that if the investor doesn't put, you might have to pay, you know, 10%. But to this point, I haven't seen an investor not put. And most of the investors in this industry are in it for the long haul, and most of them put. You know. And that's going to be documented in some form or fashion. It's definitely going to be in the projections. And I believe in the documents, it's not explicitly clear that they will honor that put option um, because there's another kind of uh, kind of uh, this the true debt opinion that we have to be able to get. We can't say that we're going to forgive that loan, basically. Yeah, like, yeah, the yeah, forgive yeah. is kind of like it's like the F word. Like when the attorneys hear it, typically they will like kind of jump me about it. They don't like us to even use that word. Yeah. And so, but 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 that is the idea. And so it won't say it explicitly. Um, so typically the next question is, well, how do we know the investor is going to honor the put? Well, if they stop honoring the put, then they're probably going to be out of business pretty quickly. Yeah. And that's why I said, see, when you buy that, now you own the debt, right? Because you're at the top of the structure, and what's dropping out of the bottom of that CDE is debt. So the CDE kind of pops out of the picture, and then you you end up owning those loans to yourself. And under tax law, when you own your own debt, it's a debt forgiveness event, and that's why there's a taxable event in year seven. So the anticipation is you own the the developer owns the investment fund. The CDE goes away somehow, either through a liquidation or a distribution of the assets, or whatever. they go away. So now the investment fund and the borrower are effectively the same entity, and for tax purposes, they're disregarded generally, right? I mean, they're, they're, or they're regarded as the same. Oh, yeah, they just own their own debt. Right. Yeah, they, they own their own debt, yeah. And so, you know, there's some, like I said, there's some things that you can sort of try to structure around, which we're not going to go into, but but it's hard to. I mean, if the building has any sort of fair market value, it's difficult to avoid the true debt, I mean, the debt forgiveness. Yeah. But a lot of times these buildings are under, you know, they're getting a whole lot more financing than what they're worth in the beginning. And in seven years, there might still be a gap there where the value of that building isn't worth the debt, and there's some planning you can do around avoiding forgiveness at that point. So.